Good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Coffin, and I want to welcome you to a delayed Saturday morning tech show. Uh, we uh, we finally kind of uh, figured out what was going on with the one machine not being quite powerful enough to handle the uh, the hangout. So we'll make some hardware changes here in the next week if we want to do this again. But uh, we've got a very illustrious panel down here, and believe it or not, we're we're going to bring them in this way. And uh, I, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of uh, a driving here. We're going to start with Andy McCaskey from RVNNN. Andy, go ahead, introduce yourself, and say hello to everybody. Yeah, hey, uh, good afternoon or good morning, as the case uh, may be. This is uh, my uh, first experience in a Google Hangout, and uh, it's uh, a little, little bit on the strange side. We've been uh, kind of using Skype as a backup channel or, or an order wire to coordinate, but... Uh, uh, I think uh, it's got some promise here. We'll we'll see in the next hour. I think the uh, the key here is is uh, definitely coordinating. And then of course we got Jeffrey Powers. Jeffrey, you want, and you look you want to say hello, everybody? Hey everybody, this is Jeffrey Powers uh, from Geekazine, and yeah, um, this is uh, not my first time, but uh, this <laughs> has uh, been an, a very interesting experience as of yet with Corona, with Google Plus. Uh, yeah, Google Plus. That's the <laughs> that's what we're using, right? Something like that. Man. Absolutely. And Rick, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, this is uh, Rick Savoy with the Force Field, and um, yeah, this is my first time too. I'm I'm a virgin on this. <laughs> we got we got a bunch of uh, well, it, it it guess it works, you know. If we if we're finding out that uh, for the first time you're up, Steve, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Steve Lee with NetcastStudio.com, and this has been an experience. Uh, can we say the word potential? <laughs> I think that's potential. Potential. And of course, uh, my name is Todd Cochran, and I'm here in the studio. Um, we are actually on the webcam for um, the system, so it, it looks kind of hokey from a from a video st standpoint. But you know, I have to have to say here, what's going on is I've got two streams running, and then I'm running Hangout in a connection where the main stream is being pushed. So it's scaring me a little bit because. We're already bandwidth challenged here as it is, but uh, thanks guys for for coming out, and we're gonna try a little experiment here with uh, with Hangout. But I guess you know what we could do for a few minutes is just talk a little bit about uh, what you guys think about Hangout so far. Andy, uh, I know that you're just in here in like for two minutes, but what what do you think about Hangout? Well, I think one of the things that uh, is impressive is how easy it appears to be to start one up and to um, to add a person. And we've had a chance to do that because when, uh, uh, for whatever reason, you drop out, we can re-invite you. And, and I guess that appears back on your wall, so to speak, and you can click and then come back into the group. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I was, that, that was, and I'm getting a little notice right down here on the actual um, uh, Google Plus site that basically said, hey, it's, I saw direct uh, invites from both you and uh, and Jeffrey, so um, that's pretty cool. So, Rick, I know that you – when did you get into Google Plus? Well, I received an invite from a friend um, last week, but I was only able to actually set it up this morning. And to be honest, I about five minutes before I got in here, that's when I had everything set up. So I agree with um, – you know, I agree with Andy that uh, – it's pretty easy to set up. I was actually surprised. Now, one thing that uh, we can hear is we definitely, some of you have a little bit uh, more sensitive mics than others. If you have a mic that's not completely, I guess for a better word, dialed in, um, we can hear every breath you take. And uh, I guess that, that used to be a song, yeah? <laughs> so. <laughs> It might be the it might be the boost option in the uh, in the volume if you're using Windows because that that boost option can really play uh, havoc yeah, sometimes potentially. So Steve, what uh, how long have you been in uh, Google Plus and what did you think about uh, this? Is your is this your first time using the Hangout? Oop, oop. Yeah, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is my first time in Hangout, and I got to tell you, it's actually kind of cool uh, versus uh, various ways we have to do it with Skype. Um, I didn't have time to really hook up my normal podcasting gear to this, so using a USB headset, and like you said, uh, you really got to watch the sensitivities. 
but I got to tell you, I think it's really cool. Uh, I'm loving Google Plus right now. I've never honestly been a fan of the competitor, you might say. I uh, use it for business purposes, but not personal. But this I'm finding I am enjoying more on a personal uh, basis. But, you know, this, uh, this Hangout, I think it's really, really cool. And I think as we move on here, we're going to have as many as, you know, I think you can put 15 people in the Hangout. And uh, I could see a point here in the near future where we would uh, invite uh, listeners to come in and, uh, and hang out with us. And I think that would be the most fun part is being able to, uh, you know, have listeners in with us at the same time that we're, we're doing the show and they can make, uh, make some comments. But I think every, each one of you will have a chance to go through and, you know, on your own websites, uh, comment on Google plus, but I think what I want to do today is kind of stick with my normal show format here. And, uh, I'm a little bit handicapped because I, I'm not going to be able to, I don't think I can patch in the other screens at this point, but uh, I do have my tech stuff lined up for you guys to talk about. And um, does anybody have any, oh, by the ways or special things going on with their shows before we uh, dial into the, uh, into the stack here? Uh, actually, yeah, I, uh, just uh, so everybody knows my uh, main podcast, uh, the Geekazine Weekly Podcast was laid to rest two weeks ago. As I rebooted the uh, the the uh, show, it's now called Geek Smack, and you can find it at thegeeksmack.com, and a lot of great great stuff over at Geekazine. You know, Andy, I know you were over at a geocaching event last uh, weekend. How how did that? Uh... That was was really really interesting. Uh, we had a chance to uh, attend this Geo Woodstock Nine, which is the ninth. Um, uh, year that they have had a gathering of people from all over uh, North America, and uh, I was kind of uh, vaguely aware of uh, of geocaching, but I had no idea uh, a that the the enthusiasm for the technology, and b the fact uh, of uh, the social network aspects of uh, of geocaching, and uh, I'm I'm learning more and more. In fact, I had invited. Um, uh, just a moment ago, when I invited you here to the to the hangout, I uh, had uh, just a connection this morning with uh, with Andy Smith, who is uh, uh, an avid geocacher, hoping to get him on here. But uh, uh, I think that uh, it's it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, uh, hobby that has got a lot of technical component uh, to it. All right, cool. Let me. Uh, I guess Andrew Edwards is trying to uh, get in. So if someone can find him in. Uh... Google I'll Plus. Do I'll do that. All right. Oh, by the way, I've been going through a massive revamp of my website at forcefield.net, so I've, I'm trying to get everything to look more consistent. So I've been um, completely revamping uh, my my whole branding, the way the web website looks, uh, the portal, the podcast page, and uh, I'm about to do the forums tonight, so it's going to look a lot cleaner. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I am finally going to look into doing some video up there. So I'm, I'm sure you'll be <laughs> happy to hear that, Todd, get more people on board with the video. Uh, I know I've been a holdout on that, but uh, I'm looking to do that more in the future. Got to get me some lights, though. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the lights always uh, on the video part. The lights are always the the uh, the number one, the number one yeah. challenge, um, largely because it's a. Uh, you know they're expensive to buy good lights um and i've been on a budget <laughs> if if you go over to the local hardware store and you get yourself some energy efficient lights and some cans you got to make sure that they're the uh soft white light um not the the not the light that when you turn it on it it looks yellow but it looks a nice whiter or a light blue it helps out a lot i've got a 100 watt bulb right now which uh works in this room right here well, I've been looking at a three-light uh, setup uh, that I actually purchased for the company that I work for, uh, and it's worked pretty well there. And this uh, three-light kit is only like a little over $100, about a, almost $150. So it's, I'm looking at doing that to maybe really do it right in here. Um, but uh, once again, I've had to budget it in, so soon. <laughs> 
I'm turning my yeah. We still use. <laughs> um, we, we've got some professional softbox lights, but uh, we still have um, uh, two of the. Well, actually, four now of the uh, forty dollar Target uh, Japanese paper lanterns that will take. Uh, I believe it's four bulbs. So we get uh, these the soft white that Jeffrey was talking about. And then inside that diffuser, they, they really provide a nice uh, soft uh, fill light. Well, I like what uh, both you and Jeff have done with, uh, with, with your video cast. So I, I really, I, th I think uh, Jeff's done some great stuff with his green screens. Thanks. Thanks. So, Jeffrey, what's the trick in having, you know, I've been clicking on people's faces. What's the trick in having it uh, take over and, and do it by itself like it's supposed to? What do you mean the trick? Yeah, what's the... I think I think once you click on it, uh, you can't you can't automate it back. I haven't found a way to do that. Uh, that sucks. Well, I guess I, I uh, went down that uh, went down that road. I got a well, webcam that, that wants to actually, uh, autofocus. Funny. Go actually, ahead. there might be a <clears throat> uh, might be a trick, and that is hit the settings button and then and then hit the save button, and it'll go back. Yeah, potentially. I wonder why this uh, this webcam is. Uh, it sucks. It was actually working great. Uh, let's let's try and put it in a different position. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> what what webcam is it? It's a good webcam, but I it's you know just like everything else this morning. It's what uh, good what plan? Temperamental. <laughs> <laughs> everything goes to waste. All right, so let me go ahead here and uh, bring up my first tech topic. You guys heard about the six strike law, right? It's uh, being proposed by well, not six strike law, but Six strike agreement that's been made between the uh, the RAAA and MPAA, where they're going to work with all the major ISPs and basically say, okay, you've, it's it's a six step process. Uh, a lot of it's all done by email for getting you to be essentially removed from your internet connection. I'm kind of uh, curious what your guys' thoughts are on what they're doing. Well, I'll jump up there. From a commercial standpoint, I wonder what sort of due process or protection there might be, you know, from a malicious claim that you were doing that uh, when, in fact, uh, you weren't. But uh, how do you defend yourself against that? Yeah, I, I don't know, Andy. It's it's one of those things that, uh, you know, and if you want to contest, you got to spend $37 to contest it. So you have to pay them for the, you know, to go in and review your account. So what what are the facts on the process? Uh, do they just uh, um, uh, does RIAA come in and uh, say we suspect that you've downloaded six uh, songs, so therefore uh, you know we're petitioning the ISP to, to cut off your service? Is that how it works? Well, the way it says is that in the first response, the um, the notice is given by <clears throat> by the copyright owner. And then the ISP will send an online alert to the subscriber, such as an email notifying the subscriber that his or her account may have been misused for content theft and that the content theft is illegal in violation of published policies and the consequences which could result from any such conduct. And then they go on to give them some educational uh, materials. And uh, then that's what you get for the first alert. The second alert, is you get another email, except that you may have to go to a website and click through and say, I acknowledge that I might be doing something wrong. The third alert, um, he or she receive another alert, which much like the initial alert, however, this alert will provide a conspicuous mechanism, another pop-through landing page. Um, fourth alert, if the subscriber account appears to have been used for content theft, the subscriber will receive yet another again alert that the subscriber has to acknowledge in the fifth alert you actually have to i think call someone and talk to them about it and um you may have your um these steps are referred to as mitigation measures you may include a temporary reduction of internet speeds redirection to a landing page until the subscriber contacts the isp um some more propaganda about copyright uh more and then basically they, they have to they call and talk to the ISP. And the sixth alert um, is whether or not the ISP is going to um, 
Let's see, what does it say? Say whether or not the ISP has previously waived mitigation measures at the subscriber's account. Again, it appears to have been used for content theft. The ISP will send another alert and will implement mitigation measures described above as described above. It will likely be very few subscribers who, after having received multiple alerts, will persist or, or allow others to persist in content theft. So essentially, they're, they're going to they're going to continue to email you and abuse you if you are copying content. Now, the question is, does the six alert system six alert system start over every time you get a notice from a copyright or is it on a per vendor basis i don't know that's a good question how do you how do you police the first one to the second one to the third one to the fifth one so on and so forth so um i've 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 gone i'm i'm with charter and we had that same issue with uh with illegal downloads they would send out emails and stuff like that uh saying hey this is, is uh somebody from on your uh on your internet account downloaded a copy of uh i don't know Battlestar Galactica or something like that and then uh and then you'd get another email saying this is this was your second warning um i would guess that uh you would be under scrutiny for a period of time so if you do it again within like a six month period, then you're on strike two or strike three. Yeah, I would imagine so too. So anyone else want to weigh in on this? I respect the copyright loss uh, greatly. So, uh, you know, and, and coming from, from a position of someone who's, who's done film and video in the past and, and, you know, I'm, I'm all for protecting copyrights, but I think that this whole thing has just gotten so out of hand. Uh, and, and to be honest, the, the RIAA, the MPAA, uh, I, I want to be diplomatic about this, but I, I, think, I think these uh, entities, are, they, they need to be reined in a little bit. That's all I can say. <laughs> you know, people that are habitually going after this kind of content. You really think they're going to acknowledge and respond to these uh, numerous emails and attempt to get them to stop? I don't think so. Uh, no. They're always going to find alternative ways to do it. I'm concerned about the, the innocent people that are going to get caught up in this. That's what I'm concerned about. Yeah. It, well, they're, uh, they're, from the RIAA perspective, that's uh, certainly well-founded because I think they had quite a business going after grandmas there for a while. It's all, it was nothing more than a shakedown is really all it was. It still is. Yeah, there was a wasn't there a nine year old girl that got shaken mm -hmm. down? Right. Yeah. Well, it's they they you know, they're a money machine, but yet they continue to give very little money back to the artists. I think that's the thing that that irritates me the most. You know, while they Well it's like the BSA. Yeah. Todd, to, uh, to uh, dip technically into um, G1 here for, or in, into Google Plus for just a second. Yeah. Your audio, just the last um, uh, few seconds, was the first foldback, the first distortion that I have heard in this whole conversation. I think they really have put some attention into uh, making this audio stable. Well, I, you know, I was uh, on several of these uh, and not having this type of webcam quality i don't know what's going on with this webcam but uh the uh and i'm getting a little i'm getting a little audio feedback from someone that's on a speaker but the so far everything's been pretty good from an audio standpoint it, it'll wobble once in a while but not too bad i'm yeah, impressed with the clarity mm -hmm. let me go ahead I just had some other uh, uh, Google Plus news that uh, um, that I saw uh, in a comment from Doug K. Uh, apparently, the uh, Google Plus uh, the invitations are closed uh, officially once again. But apparently, if you go to a if you go to uh, plus.google.com on a browser that is not logged in, uh, apparently you can sign in without an invite. Hmm. Well, that's. There's been some ways to get in and out. They opened up the invite period yesterday for a number of hours, and people were able to get in. Um, I did a whole bunch of invites to folks, and they were able to get in. But, uh, you know, it's just like the Gmail rush days. Everyone wanted a Gmail account, sure. so things are going to pass. So how many of you Mac users are ready for, uh, for Lion next week? 
I'm I'm hanging <laughs> back a little bit on lion. Well, why is that? Well, it's uh, for the same reason that I would hang back on almost almost any anything. I'm probably probably going to let it percolate here for a month or two. I, I'm glad that I held back on uh, uh, on the uh, uh, final on uh, final cut. Ah, come on now, Andy. You got you got to get in there and, and get a taste of it so that you can, uh, <laughs> you know, so you can be be punished uh, right off the bat. Yeah, so you can do help help them with their uh, their unpaid uh, beta test program. Yeah, they're not the only ones to do that, though. True. You know, I'm actually looking very much forward to Lion, but I think one of the drawbacks is going to be how you're getting the media, since it's going to be through the store itself, and it's a downloadable product. What do you do in terms of, you know, a, a rescue disc, or what if you have slow bandwidth? Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to put a lot of people in a predicament where they're not either one going to be able to get it. Although Apple says you can go into the iTunes store nearest iTunes uh, or excuse me, Apple store nearest one to me is like three hours away. So I don't think that's a viable option for a lot of people too. So I think they're going to have to really look at alternative ways to distribute the new OS. Well, I figured out why Andrew wasn't in here. He, uh, he has a weird email, and he just gave it to me. A weird email for Google Plus, so he should be in here directly. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Apparently, apparently the Google in uh, the Hangout uh, went over to my Google Plus account. I don't know. I, I, I'm 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 guessing because I was might have been the first one in here. Yeah, I think uh, it did after you left. Yeah. So. All right, cool. Well, I think Andy, I'm going to make the jump on a couple of machines here, and. Uh, I don't know if you. Oh, that webcam is pissing me off. Autofocus is turned off, but yet it uh, it doesn't want it. Doesn't seem to be uh, removing autofocus. I'm gonna keep the picture off me. Um, I went. To, it's been three years since I did a uh, a Mac update, and uh, I've got a new MacBook Pro sitting here. So, hey, there's Andrew. Andrew, welcome to uh, welcome to the Hangout. We finally got you in. Yes. So, yeah, I'm having some weird difficulties over here <laughs> <laughs> i think uh, i think it's the story of the morning we were getting our butts kicked with the you definitely don't want to run this on a machine it's just designed to run a single skype connection so what do you think of google oh. plus <laughs> right right <laughs> so what do you think of google oh, yeah, plus so far? my first hangout what's well, your first hangout my first hangout because no one knows my email address because Google Plus doesn't allow you to associate multiple, you know, email addresses into one profile like other services do. Right. So, like, I had to use my Gmail address when I first joined, but now I can't associate my Gear Live address, which is what everyone knows. Yeah. Like, they, they're calling that a separate account. Like, my webcam mm -hmm. over here is the one that's recording. It won't let me switch. So, Yeah. In the yeah, but but the other side of that is I've I've got uh, a, a mix up between my Edwards and my YouTube and my Gmail that that I can't get pulled <laughs> apart. So you know, they, they, a little work needed there. Right. Come on, Google. So when the invites were open yesterday, what I did is that oh, that webcam is pissing me off. What I did last night was uh, I invited my rawvoice.com address in. So now I've got two profiles that I don't know how I'm going to change the other one because I've got two Todd Cochran's in. <laughs> so you're right, Andrew. So, you know, yeah. I'm going to get followed on one and the other, and they need to be – there's a way to merge them, but it then you're really tied to the hip between a Google Plus account and other accounts. Well, right, they exactly. They say don't do too much with your with your accounts uh, because how they're going to – change up with the business google plus accounts well i know that but um it still it was an email account where most you know there's half the people know me at geeknews at gmail.com and half the people know me at ceo at raw voice so mm -hmm. so andrew when the when lion comes out you're going to make the jump the first day or are you already running the beta um yeah i've been running lion from a few months now and I was surprised because I actually, like, I always have a developer account, not because I'm a developer, but because, you know, I just like to try things out and report on them. And so I, I, I think I started doing this with Tiger, 
Um, so I did it with tiger, leopard, snow leopard, and now lion. And lion, just with the first beta, was like, it felt like just a solid finished product, unlike the other ones that always had problems. So as the beta's gone along, it's just gotten more and more solid. Like, it feels, you know, definitely, I'm running a Golden Master now, and it's it's fantastic. There's no, I haven't found any issue except for one piece of software that the last time it was updated was 2007. Other than that, it's it's great. What do you find about drivers for printers and uh, scanners and that sort of thing? Is uh, is that still yet to be resolved? Um, no. Well, what Apple does now is if you install a new printer, which they didn't do this before, but if you install a new printer, a software update pops right up and says, you've installed a new printer. Here's the brand. We're just going to download the driver for you. So you don't even have to choose. It just knows what to get and it installs it and you're done. Mm. Very cool. Yeah. I'll be honest, guys. I uh, I used um, when I got this new Mac this week. Um, I was talking to the guys in the Apple Store, and I said, "Listen, I just bought uh, the new um, Final Cut. I've got it on another machine. I've uh, got um, you know. I'm going to go ahead and start using this as my primary machine, and I'm going to give the probably the other machine to the kids. So." You know what do I do about this stuff? He said, "Oh no, no." He says, uh, "Just everything. All your purchases are tied underneath your your Google. I mean, your Apple account, and uh, just log in and reinstall it on the other machine. And uh, you know, don't you know?" He says, uh, "You know, we know how many computers you own." And basically, he didn't tell me, <laughs> but he almost. I said, "Listen, I'm a business. I'm buying this under a business account." I said, "I don't think I can run." three copies of Final Cut on three different machines I only paid one copy for. He says, well, it's all under one Google, I mean, one under one Apple account. So I've got to get in and read the licensing. The last thing I want to do is abuse the licensing stuff. But it sounds to me like a normal homeowner, if they bought uh, Final Cut on one machine, they can install it on two or three others and only pay for it once. I don't understand the... Uh, the financial model there it seems to go against everything they've ever done but uh maybe apple allows that but can you imagine any other software developers allowing them to do that no this guy's actually correct um the apple store the mac app store specifically states that you pay once and you can download anywhere that you have your apple account on you so if you down if you buy final cut and you have 20 computers in your house you're it specifically says you're free to just like just like the iphone if you buy an app you can install that app on any iPod Touch, iPhone, iPad, however many you have in your home. Um, it's the same thing. They don't, they don't separate it by business or personal anymore. And um, a lot of developers have actually been saying that despite that clause, they've been earning way more money um, through the Mac App Store with that, with that model than they have been on selling it on their own websites in the past. Is it because people aren't pirating? Yeah, exactly. People aren't pirating. People, it's built right in. It's like right into on your dock when you buy a Mac. The App Store is right there, and you're, you're getting a ton of promotion from Apple. And you know, and Apple's never been about um, you know, what do you call it, activation codes or anything like that. So even with something like Lion, when it comes out for thirty bucks, you just buy that once, and then you just log in on all your Macs and install it. It's crazy. That's amazing. Well, uh, it's good for all of us that are buying software. Andy, how's that feel for your pocketbook? Well, I, actually, that is, I I was there was there was a there was a utility that I was running uh, on. Uh, in fact, this is this is actually a pretty neat uh, pretty neat app. If you are a uh, uh, if you are writing for web publication, uh, it's it's called it's an app called Byword, which allows you to. Um, uh, basically, it's a very simplified word processor, but it allows you to use markdown language in that. And then uh, you go ahead and hit the button, and you've got uh, uh, well-formed HTML that you can paste into your WordPress. Uh, and it, it takes care of the uh, formatting and uh, underlines and lists and, and, and a whole bunch of things. And I had installed it on one machine and found it very, very useful. I said, okay, I need to have this on another machine. And I went in to try and buy it. And it said, uh, hey, you already own that app. Uh, so here's the install. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't see Microsoft following that model. Can you imagine getting, <laughs> can you imagine getting uh, the next version of, of Windows and paying 39 or whatever the cost is going to be, paying 39 bucks and, 
Again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven machines here that are running Windows. Can you imagine getting that money back? No, <clears throat> it's they're not going to do it, but it's definitely the hey, way. That max all about cost <clears throat> of ownership, Todd. Well, I, I I paid for that cost of ownership when I walked out of the store and looked at my how much lighter my uh, bank account was. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's just it, it is. I guess pay me now, pay me later, right? Yeah. Well, the thing with uh, the other thing about um, the Mac App Store is they announced that they're now the top seller of software above Best Buy and above Amazon now. Really? And the Mac App Store has been around for a few months, and they're they've already they're already selling more software than Best Buy sells. So they're obviously doing something right by building it in to your Mac and charging you once and allowing you to install it anywhere that your profile exists. Wild. Mm. I think you're going to find that as the two total different business models between, for example, Microsoft and Apple, and that is Microsoft's core business is software, as where Apple's core business is actually hardware, not software. The software is a complement to their product. I kind of see it the reverse. I kind of feel like Apple's products are their – their main product is their software, and their hardware is just the elegant you know, housing for that. I mean, iOS is definitely – you know, if they didn't have that, the iPhone, you know, wouldn't be anywhere near as, you know, desirable as it is without the, I think the software is kind of the, like the, Steve Jobs said, the soul of their, of their products. Well, I think they treat it more like firmware. I think they really treat it more like firmware than software. Hmm. Yeah. One thing I will say, guys, is that, you know, I did the migration and that took no time. That was almost instantaneous and then when i wanted i basically i had not played in the app store that much so i loaded the i loaded the app store and i said okay i want this 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 and i click 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 clicked and quickly racked up about 250 bucks in <laughs> in buys but it was software that i wanted on the machine and it started to install it was about 11 o'clock at night. I went to bed. I got up the next morning. The machine's ready. I mean, to me, and I'm sure there's going to be some more stuff I'm going to buy, but I'm looking right here on the taskbar. I've got uh, all my editing stuff. I've got Keynote in here. I've got Pages. You know, I've got a Twitter client. I've got a number of different uh, apps that are just, you know, stuff that I use on a normal basis. And I, again, I'm... Now, I'm a primary a Windows guy, and this is going to be the first machine I'm not going to install Parallels on. So we'll see how this works. I'm going to try to, you know, use not use Windows on this box. But, you know, I'm still a primary a Windows guy. I could have never set up a Windows machine and click, 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 and be done. Right. And, I mean, it was that simple. Yeah. Yeah. And you know That's another interesting thing. Yeah, you also mentioned how you you easily racked up a bunch of of fees very quickly. That's another thing that they I don't I don't really know what it is about them the way they lay out their, both the App Store on the mobile devices and on the on the Mac. But there's something about either the design or aesthetically that just makes you and also the one click access I guess where you don't have to put in a credit card it just makes it so easy to just you know over the course of a week look back at your bill and say wow I spent a couple hundred dollars here I didn't even know. But I yeah, did. that was one of the things that <laughs> Wired Magazine had an article about um, the psychology of buying and so forth. And they pointed out that uh, even though Apple has that information where they could hit your credit card, you know, in the next 12 hours or whatever, they often delay it by uh, a number of days so that you've had a chance to get to enjoy <laughs> the thing before you hit the pain. Nice. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Know, I do notice that I get my uh, my Apple credit card bill. I think once a week. I think I don't think I get it uh, immediately after. I think on the App Store I get them pretty quick. But but it was. Uh, I don't think I've seen the bill yet for um, for the stuff I bought for the Mac. But you know, one thing that is is that I do know is that you know my mom. <sighs> She has a hard time installing stuff. I just can say, hey, Mom, go to the app store, buy this, buy that, and buy this. And it's really been an eye-opener for me. I, I was poo-pooing the app store 
significantly because oh, it's this walled garden, and you know, you know, you you know, the apple once again is uh, you know putting screws to everyone and making it go. But they've got quite the ecosystem here. I, I don't, uh, I don't doubt. Well, and you consider from a developer's standpoint that Apple is taking the the, the credit collection piece out of it, uh, and and that fee becomes a lot more reasonable as far as uh, I guess they absorb fraud uh, uh, issues and and all sorts of things that an independent developer would have to deal with himself. Yeah, it's curious. It definitely is. Well, let me go ahead here and talk a little bit about uh, an article that was in the Washington Post. Um, this was an article that uh, was talking about Netflix criticizing new internet internet billing by the bits. Um, Netflix said Friday that moves by internet server providers to change use, charge users about the amount of data they use could end up costing consumers more. So this is a opinion piece they did in the Wall Street Journal, and um, you know, I, I, everyone. I, I talk to people and I say, um, are you worried about internet caps? And most people say, no, no, I'm not worried about it. Um, but I think what we've seen over the last year is that the amount of usage on mobile devices, while it started at a certain level, has continued to increase. And I think they are trying to stay ahead of that curve. But are any of you guys on caps and is it affecting you at all? No, I'm not on any caps, but, you know, those people that say uh, that I'm not worried about it, I haven't been impacted, is because they haven't reached that tier yet. Uh, the entire uh, Bronbad model is going to tiered structures, and we all need to be aware of it. So, no. Andrew, you're on Fios, aren't you? Yeah, I'm on uh, – well, it was – in my area, something weird happened. It was Verizon Fios, which was awesome. And then a company called Frontier came in and oh. bought um, a bunch, I think like 13 <laughs> of the fi Verizon Fios markets. Now it's Frontier Fios. It's been that way for about a year, and they just stopped innovating. It's still the same speed. I have uh, yep. 35 up, 35 down. But when I look at the Verizon Fios markets, they're getting so much more innovation, and I've just been stagnant. But still, the speed is nice. Um, there is definitely no cap. Um, but what they're doing here with Frontier is if you want to sign up today for new Internet service, they want to charge you something like a $500 deposit up front. Basically, they're trying to wow. discourage people from signing up for their service. Instead, they want you to sign up for DirecTV, and then they get like a little affiliate bonus for referring you to DirecTV because they, they don't want to have to manage a high-speed Fios network. They'd rather you go elsewhere to their competition and make a little money from the kickback that the competition gives them by sending you there. So, you know, I'm kind of grandfathered in. I don't have any of that stuff going on with my personal account, and the speed is fantastic. But, you know, the thing, like you said, about these caps is it's very convenient for the providers right now because things are go like things like Netflix and iCloud and Hulu and, you know, Amazon Cloud Player, all these things that are, are now storing your stuff in the cloud. Now that all your stuff is in the cloud, gigabytes of storage, you're going to be using a lot more of that bandwidth that you weren't using before, and now is when they're deciding to put these caps on. So it's obvious people are going to start hitting these caps you know, very soon. When I, I'm running the iOS 5 beta right now, and um, there's an iCloud beta. And my phone, you know, without me knowing, just you know, in the background, it backed up you know, about five gigabytes of data to mm. iCloud because I just turned it on. That's five gigabytes that, you know, I didn't even know was happening. I couldn't really see it. And I don't mind because I have no cap. But when you have a 250 gig cap and five gigabytes just goes to your phone the day you set it up, you know, it, I don't know. I think people are going to start hitting those caps as they start subscribing to more of these services that are in the cloud. One question for you, Andrew. Did you just say it was a $500 deposit or was it a $500 install fee what i think it's an install fee it's 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 some i don't know what i think it's an install fee but it's something where basically hey if you want our service that costs you know 40 bucks a month we're also going to charge you 500 dollars up front in order for you to get that service so if I'm you don't want to pay that you should sign up for direct tv yeah i was wondering if it was more of a like a uh, like a down payment or something like that so if you do go over your cap it 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 digs into that five hundred dollars. Uh, well, there's no cap, so it's definitely not. It's definitely not um, related oh, okay. to a cap because it's there's no cap on FiOS right now. It's just, you know, I just think Frontier wants to get out. <laughs> like they bought, <laughs> they bought FiOS and now they regret it. 
Every, oh, okay. Every time I hear the word frontier, I hear negative stuff. My mom yeah. bitches about frontier every day of the week. I haven't heard it's nothing good about that. Todd, I have uh, about 90 feet from my building here. There are There is supposedly fiber in the ground right here on the County Road 9. And I am less than a mile from the central office. And uh, since October of last year, I have not been able to even get a, fi get a frontier guy to come out and talk with me about access to that wow. fiber. Wow. And I've, and I've talked mm -hmm. to senior management people, you know, and they, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're committed to the future. And this, that's exactly where <laughs> communications is going, et cetera. And it's like, well, talk to me. How much is this in dollars? And, oh, well, we'll, we'll get back to you. You know, as far as the smartphones are concerned, you know, Verizon has just recently announced that they're eliminating their uh, unlimited data plan, like yeah, AT&T did. Which and, is a uh, bad move. Yeah. Bad move. Now, we were fortunate to get into on Verizon before that happened. Uh, so people that are grandfathered in, as far as I know right now, are not going to be held to that. But anyone who signs up for it after, you know, that that date is uh, is going to be affected. Um you know, I, uh, I I think this that's going to be a problem for a lot of these these uh, new users. Well, and then you have a lot of the people that are uh, are on their two year uh, two year plans almost up. Uh, I got the iPhone three GS, and now my oh, is my data plan going to change? As is, uh, what's going to happen there? No, you're, you'll be grandfathered yeah. in as long as you stay with AT&T, but this, I think this data cap thing is just it's another lock-in method because if I stay with AT&T, as long as I stay with AT&T, I have unlimited data. If I ever want to get the Verizon iPhone, if I want to switch, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose that. So why would I want to switch now? You know, yeah. AT&T now has me locked in because all the carriers are getting rid, except for Sprint, are getting rid of um, unlimited data. You know what's interesting about this Annie, is that the, the more we get involved in what's going on in the conversation, the, the whole switching thing just kind of like becomes transparent. The name Hangout's actually a very good one. Did the did the audio just go bad for everybody else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. a minute. Yeah, that was. I think it was on Andy's side. Okay, say again, Andy. We didn't hear a thing you said. Yeah. Oh, you're, was, yeah. It's, um, it's you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The bad, the bad audio is audio bad. gone bad. Yeah. Andy, here's here's what you do, Andy. Go into the set. Just hit the settings button, and then hit okay. save, and then uh, and then everything just seems to come back into play. That was crazy. Well, it's, it just shows you the Hangout still has some Hangout issues. Better, better, better. better, better. No. No. Nope. Same. Wow. Are you on? Are you on a USB mic or are you on a, uh, a regular jack? Yeah, yeah, USB. USB. Um. Well, I would also suggest unplugging. Oh wait! Oh wait! No! 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 Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe he needs to get that frontier guy out there. Right. That's what it was. We started talking about. Hey, Andy, if you want, you can also drop out and come back. That might help too. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, we don't hear you at all now, Andy. Is, is that better? No, it's nope. you know. Is that now? Oh, no, 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 it's 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 bad. Okay, I'll drop out. Drop out. <laughs> <That's> hilarious. <laughs> he sounded like Princess Leia in Return of the Jedi when she had that mask on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we started talking about Frontier, and man, immediately it. Uh, the frontier guys are like, oh, okay, we'll see what we'll do. We'll just screw with these guys' bandwidth connection. I guess I better not talk about Time Warner. They're very touchy about that, too. <laughs> yeah, Time Warner, I'm sure, doesn't like me here. I, I push a lot of uh, upwards bandwidth. I'm sure this node out here is, gets crushed. Hey, the, they don't uh, like me. The, uh, the next thing I've got on my stack here is, uh, I'm sure Andy will want to talk about Frontier when he gets back, but Amazon's put in an order for 1.2 million tablets. Any uh, any thoughts? I have not heard that. They're going to sell a ton of them. They are going to. That's going to be the i the iPad competitor right there. It's my prediction, at least. Yeah, I. You know, I. I what are they going to do? Are they going to run on Android or what? 
I think it's going to be Android, but you know, the thing about Amazon with so many people, the, the reason the Kindle is so successful is because you go to Amazon.com and it is right there on the front page. No matter if you're going to, there to buy an iPod or toilet paper or food or whatever, the Kindle is right there front and center for every single visitor, and that's what they're going to do with this tablet. And um, Yeah, the, I think that's going to be the very first real challenger. I don't even know want to call it challenger, but the first tablet that people are going to buy a lot of in droves other than the iPad. Yeah, someone's got their phone near a audio connection. Well, I I don't know if I don't know if you guys noticed but uh over at Best Buy, at least the Best Buys in my area, they've they've remodeled their uh their tech area and they have a whole island kiosk now with uh with tablets. So I'm guessing that Amazon really wants to compete with Best Buy because they especially in the brick and mortar stores to keep everything uh, or, or, well not the brick and mortar stores for Amazon of course but uh um to try and keep the uh the the sales up. Well right, but I think they sell all those same tablets at Best Buy sells, but the thing is when you buy an Amazon tablet they're they're able to build in the Kindle store right there. They're going to make money off the tablet. They're going to make money off the books you buy. None of the other tablet makers have that advantage. They have the entire presence of their marketplace to 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 market the product with. I mean, that's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Someone's Darth Vader again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Andy. Oh, is it Andy? Is it me? It's yes. Yeah, <laughs> Somebody sounds like Darth oh. Vader. Somebody sounds like Princess Leia. This is this is turning into a Star Wars thing. It's, awesome. <laughs> it's always the audio. It's always on. And in, in my part, it's the video too. So, uh, you know this is. <laughs> <laughs> but but once you get the audio, right video out. working, you'll be okay. Yeah, that in five shows from now or something like that. So let's let's talk just a second about this social media background check that the folks over at uh, Gizmodo did on their some of their bloggers. Did you guys see that article? No, yeah. no, I did not. No. Well, what they did, and I, I, of course I can't bring the screen up here, but they they paid this company that's been approved by the FTC. It's a company called Social Intelligence. Um, they basically ran background checks social media and online background checks on all their employees. And here's some of the stuff they found. Uh, one of their guys had uh, posted something on his blog that was referring to the uh, emits use of cocaine as well as LSD. They found another section in his, in his online profile that talked about cocaine being fun. And then... He had another section in here talking about uh, more drug usage along with some photos. And then wow. they actually link into um, where he actually tweeted one time where he got some uh, drugs from somebody. And But then, yet, when they talk about all this drug usage on this guy's profile, they show a picture of him, but they black out his face and his hands so they can't tell what uh, what his skin color is or how old he is so you can't tell it's him well you you know you get this body image but you don't get uh you know you it's, it's you know like when you're interviewing someone you can't ask them their race their age their you know ethnicity or anything like that so this stuff here was blocked out and part of the profile return um but they're saying now with the ftc having given this this company um, essentially approval to do these types of background checks is that, um, you know, anything you say at all is going to be essentially at this point pulled out of the ecosystem and provided to companies during uh, background checks. And uh, I don't know what do you guys, I know companies are looking, they're doing Google searches and so forth, but what do you feel about m date, companies that specifically mine data to do, to provide to employers? And it's again, all about privacy. Don't put anything out. I mean, the, just, I don't know. People don't understand how to use their privacy settings or don't care when they're young. They just don't care. And, you know, this is the kind of, anything that's public is free game, I guess. You know, and I can imagine someone tweeting, you know, man, I went out and we, we, we raged last night. I got a hangover. You know, is that going to flag a social media background check? 
and then as an employer going to say, well, this guy drinks alcohol. And if you've got a company owner that's anti-alcohol, all of a sudden you are, you know, you're not going to get a job with them. After, uh, after I, I, I got, well, a lot of people know that I, I worked on the Windows 95 contract as a support agent. After that was done, the company that I was working with, the third-party company, was trying to put me into another uh, contract, which was Fidelity Investments, and they were they were ramping up their computer part. And the thing about and this was back in 1997, that they had a very very uh, scrutinizing background check um, with what they do. So it's first of all, it's it's just not. It's not unusual. It has. We've been doing it for many, many years. It's just that now it's gotten a lot easier. Right. Hey, you know, background checks are nothing new. Uh, they've been around forever. Uh, whether you're going for a government secret clearance or it's a, a corporation that uh, does a routine check, and you're right, it's easier now. Uh, and, you know, people are, are not being very smart. And I'll give you another example. One of my IT clients is a law enforcement agency and they had a vandalism out there the next day they heard a name they went to facebook and he bragged about it bingo nailed him i'm not sure why people want to do this maybe it's youth but i think the interrogation and in these companies going after more and more personal type information for employment is going to certainly increase well there are people that will go to a job interview and do stupid things like that too. So, uh, you know, on, on the flip side, yeah, it, maybe it's a little intrusive. Uh, but if people are dumb enough, people who are dumb enough to just post that stuff in the first place, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, would you want to hire them anyway? Now, here's the problem, though. What if you out with a bunch of buddies, and you know they post something about you? you know, online about your, you know, going to, uh, you know, having a big binge or something, you know, then there can be that cross talk too, where you may be careful about what you're putting on your own profile, but yet a friend of you, yours outs you. Um, and tags you in the that's post. That's a good point. Good point. Yeah. And it, it gets, it, it, yeah, a, a good example is this week we had a, uh, a viral video come out called, it was called, Why Are You Closed?, which was a guy that was in Toronto, Canada. Apparently they just got, they were in the middle of the G20 protests. And he, uh, they, they locked the doors of the mall uh, because of these protests. And this guy was just standing out there shaking the door and just yelling, why are you closed? Why are you closed? And it became a very viral video um, because just somebody with a smartphone holding it up. And, and even at, towards the end of the video, the guy's going, I don't want you to record this. I don't want to be on film. But yet it made its way up to YouTube. How is this guy? No, this guy's probably not in the mainstream. I'm looking for a job anyway, type uh, situation. But you know, if if you're a twenty-something year old, don't know better, and all of a sudden you hit into a viral video with something stupid, all of a sudden uh, that that can change your game immensely. Well, one thing they're talking about too is Facebook and uh, implementing a lot more face recognition technology. Now they're starting to auto tag you in photos, and. All right, so you know, what's everybody doing at a party? They got their cameras out, they're taking pictures of people, and at some point, you become auto tagged in a social media site, and you're holding a, you know, a cocktail. Um, you are inadvertently you, your your privacy's done. You there's nothing you can do. It's it's out there, and it's almost now you're going to have to have uh, events where you're going to have to say no cameras. You know, where folks are not going to be allowed to take pictures at parties and so forth. Well, the question to ask Zuckerberg there is, why? What's the point? I mean, do you really, do we really need this? Well, I think he wants it. <laughs> and then you have to ask the question, why? What's, what's the real reason behind this? Well, I don't know. But speaking of Facebook, you know, they rolled out this Skype integration this week. Oh, boy, what a yawn event that was. Any, has anyone even used the new Skype on Facebook? Yeah, I have. So how was it? Was it just like regular Facebook, uh, I mean, regular Skype video thing? You know, the one thing is it, it, it does one-on-one. -on -one, so if, if you don't want like a five to ten person hangout and you don't want it to be a public hangout um, and you just need to call somebody, it's, it's a great feature. 
uh, it shouldn't be discounted. It's just that it's not Google Hangout. It's not the ability to, to have 10 people at one time. And, uh, and so it's, it does have its place. And I think a lot of, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to like it over Google Hangout. And uh, I, think, I think it will have its place. Well, now that Microsoft owns Skype, uh, you know, we're going to see more of this this uh, sort of integration. We're going to we're going to see right. a lot more coming. Yeah. Personally, I can't wait for the uh, business stuff to show up for for Google Plus in here because what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to um, bring in the uh, like podcasters for meetings i'm going to be able to you know this is going to work out great and i'm also going to be able to have um the ability here to leave this open during the day you know I'm, we're virtual my company is so i'll have just the camera up and running and if the sales gal needs to jump in or angelo needs to jump in and have a chat um they're going to be able to and i think this is going to be the, or we'll just leave this thing up and running and yell at each other all day you know so um, I'm pretty excited about this part of the feature from a from a business standpoint. Um, obviously, there's other applications out there. I know GoToMeeting is getting ready to introduce a video component to GoToMeeting where you're going to have a, a meeting session and you're going to be able to see the people in the meeting down below. Um, that's something we're going to get briefed on before the campaign starts. That's why the folks that are on that new GoToMeeting campaign are, are getting HD webcams if they don't have them. Um, so and I'm pretty excited about what they're coming up with, but, uh, at the same point here, you've got this free product that seems to work pretty good. Um, only time will tell. So what do you guys there, think the applications here and, you know, Jeffrey talked about the one-on-one -on -one stuff, but what do you guys think about the business applications here? A lot of potential. There well, is, I there, think you're good. Go, go ahead, Andrew. There is one other thing that, that, that we have to be concerned about, and that is you're talking about how you're, you're going to leave a, a session open so you can talk with your, uh, with your programmers and stuff like that. But what happens when you want it to be a little bit more private? You can be There's, private. It, it, well, you can be private in a circle, but it never really said anything about encryption privacy within your, your session. So if I'm talking to you, how do we know somebody's not uh, not grabbing that signal and watching what we're saying? How do we know they're well, not no doing can, it on other services? If, if no one can get into the circle, uh, isn't that going to make it a little more difficult for them to to say, "Hey, you know, uh, these guys are over here. I want to I want to hack into this session." It can be uh, difficult, but there's no talk about encryption in these uh, in these uh, uh, conversations. If someone so, wants to go to that much trouble to hack my live stream hangout. Um, the, you know, more power to them. I just, I just don't see it. If, if if it becomes evident that that's happening, then Google will do something. But I can't imagine that encryption is a heavy overload. Uh, yeah. You know, you you add encryption mm -hmm. to any type of signal, you are adding immense overhead to the video stream flow. I know a little bit about this, <laughs> but you know, you. You, you add an encryption component, and every packet has to have the additional encrypting stuff, plus you have to be able to decrypt on the backside, additional overhead. I, I can't see how they would ever do that in this product. Well, it, it, the bottom line is Skype has a, it has a component that has a 256-bit AES com, uh, encryption uh, protocol. Not on their uh, video. There's no way. Yeah, actually, they do. I would be very surprised if that video stream is encrypted. I, I would be, I would honestly, I would be shocked. All, I, all I'm saying is, on a business aspect, you, you just got to watch out for stuff like that, especially if you if you're if you're running developer meetings and stuff like that. So, so who's got a parrot? I was gonna say, <laughs> the, where's the bird? <laughs> Is that your parrot? Who's got the parrot? I hear a parrot in the background. No one has a parrot? It's like outside your window in Hawaii. I think well, Polly needs a cracker. That's funny. I think someone's, I think someone's running a, a, a video of a parrot or something, but funny. Okay, well, guys, um, what do you think of this experiment running Hangout? I think it's kind of a cool way to do a show. I'm actually very impressed for this being right out of the box. 
Uh, I know they're going to be making a lot of improvements and tweaks. Like you were talking about, Todd, there's a lot of great implications of this service for business, for family, for friends. Uh, video podcasting? No. I think there's issues with the, the video switching that kind of prohibits some of that, but uh, perhaps they'll come up with some tools that will, lets us modify or use it in a little different way. But throughout this uh, hour and a half, it's really worked great. Your video, I mean, your video is the best, Steve. What kind of a camera are you using? Actually, it's funny. I wanted to use my uh, HD camera, but I couldn't get this uh, Hangout to work with uh, Firewire. So uh, right now I'm on a Logitech C910. Now that's funny because that's the same you camera. Right down. This is exactly <laughs> the same camera I have. I have a Logitech C910. And, um, and I'm on the Mac uh, with it. Yeah, so I... I it's, something's going on with focus. Andrew, your your image is pretty good too. What kind of camera are you using? Um, I'm just using the built-in eyesight on the Apple Cinema Display. Yeah, it's pretty good. And Andy, but, um, I have three displays, and and um, they're all Cinema Displays. And despite going into settings multiple times and changing it, as soon as I hit save, it goes back to this one over here. Yeah, it's odd. Andy, are you using the same thing? Are you using the Mac camera? Yeah, it's just the, uh, this is a three-year-old iMac, so um, uh, th this whatever the stock camera is uh, in the thing. The, the one comment that I had was when we got into the discussion on, uh, uh, on Frontier, oh, yeah. a couple of times where I've really gotten into the concept, <laughs> it has been very much like, you know, kind of six guys, uh, you know, hang hanging out uh, <laughs> and as the attention it's goes from one person to the other. Uh, I guess yeah. they aptly named it correctly, didn't they? <laughs> I wonder how much bandwidth we've used. How much bandwidth have we used uh, just hanging out here? Because again, going back to those bandwidth caps, like with all these new things that allow you to stream video and stream all your stuff from the cloud, like are people going to be running out of their caps that you know they weren't before because they were just surfing the web, checking That's a good email? question. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. We'll see. Over time, it will. Well, guys, um, next time we do this, we'll, uh, I'm going to make some uh, changes in hardware here. We won't uh, be 20 minutes dinking around with stuff. And I'll do some rewiring, and uh, I'm definitely going to work on my video feed, too. I'm going to feed it with a regular camera instead of this stupid uh, Logitech that keeps focusing in and out. But um, everyone that's been watching today, this has been the Saturday Morning Tech Show. We're kind of uh, doing experiment. We've been doing experiment with Google Hangout. Hope you've liked the uh, the format. If you have comments on today's show, geeknews at gmail.com. Geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline, of course, is 619-342-7365. And uh, you're reading in the back. If you can read backwards, uh, you can actually see ComSale749. It would be nice if uh, I did the reverse image on that, yeah? So, uh, anyway, guys. Well, it looks right here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's good to be. Yeah, it doesn't on the streaming stream. It looks not on Ustream, no. <laughs> it's, it's bad. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I see that on Ustream. So, uh, Andrew, where where can they find you? Um, Andrew Edwards, I'm over at GearLive.com. Andy? Yeah, Andy McCaskey at uh, RVNN.TV. Jeffrey? Uh, Geekazine.com, www.geekazine.com. Rick? Rick Savoya at www.theforcefield.net. Steve? Netcaststudio.com. And, of course, all the guys here are part of the Tech Podcast Network with uh, child family-safe content. So we hope that uh, you'll uh, check out all the great shows at, uh, at techpodcast.com. And I'm about ready to smash a camera. So we'll see everybody uh, next time. Thanks for hanging out. I'll leave this, the chat up here for a minute, but I'll shut the streams. Well, I'll leave one of the streams up. But uh, this ends the official program. Everyone else, take care. Thanks for hanging out. And aloha.